useful way of plotting this is on something called a scatter diagram. And that's where we just take the, uh, each symbol and plot it on, rather than against time, we're just plotting it on this x, y axis. So we're seeing it, because the signal is just moving between minus 0.5 and 0.5, we're seeing these two points. Um, this sort of diagram is called a scatter diagram and is pretty useful for evaluating modems when you're debugging them. You tend to draw quite a few of these sort of things. Uh, modems that run, often we have a real-time display of this sort of thing to get a feel for the signal quality and how the modem's performing. So in a real-world um, real radio channel, the signals don't look quite as good. We have noise. Uh, when you get enough noise, it introduces a bit error. So uh, in the next parts of the simulation here, we add noise at a certain signal-to-noise ratio. And this line here is where we, uh, all this uh, business here is just calculating the, the amount of noise we need to add. And here's where we add the signal, the transmit signal to the noise to get the receive signal. And if we do all that, once again, down convert the signal, but with the additive noise, we get that. So what's happened is because noise has been added to the signal, they're, they're not little tight points on that constellation, they're bouncing back and forth. Now, this is a signal to noise ratio of 10 dB, which is around about the limits of analog communication if you're transmitting single sideband or voice. But you can still see for digital, the two points in the um, scatter diagram are quite a long way away from this zero line down the center. Now, if enough, enough noise was added to this side to move one of these points over to this side, you'd get a bit error. Uh, and likewise, if an, enough noise was added to a point that should be here to make it move over here, you'd get a bit error. So as the signal to noise ratio drops, you know, those, uh, the spread in the scatter gets bigger and eventually you start generating um, bit errors. A good modem will have less bit errors for a given signal to noise ratio than a bad modem. So that's the scatter diagram showing us the effect of adding noise to the radio channel. And at 10 dB, you can still see there's you know, no bit errors there. None of those have even got close to the middle line, um, which is you know, pretty good for digital communications. Okay, in the real world, um, the transmitter and receiver are at different sites. They don't have exactly the same local oscillators mixing the signal up, then mixing it down again. There'll be difference in frequencies for those two oscillators. So we can see the effect of that uh, on the scatter diagram. So what's happened there is those points have been, are being rotated around in time because of the difference in the two up and down converters. Uh, so they're sort of moving around. If that was in real time, we'd see them move in a circle. And eventually, you can see some of these points have crossed this zero point. So due to that frequency offset between the transmitter and receiver, they're not quite tuned exactly the same, uh, we've started to get some bit errors. And that's, if you saw that on the scatter diagram, you'd know, aha, there's a problem with the, uh, the frequency offset. Now how we fix that is we don't manually adjust the receiver frequency. We have an algorithm um, called a carrier recovery or frequency estimation that works automatically works out the difference between the two um, transmitter and receiver frequency and then adjusts that. Uh, using some, some DSP magic, and that's called carrier recovery. Um, now also for a, a real world sig a system, what you'll have is the transmitter will have a D to A converter with a sample clock. It might be clocking out samples at one, I don't know, a million samples a second. The receiver will have a, an analog to digital converter that's sampling the signal at say a million samples a second. But those clocks are at two different sites, they're running at different frequencies, just slightly off, there'll be different temperatures and things, so you'll see one will be a little bit out compared to the other. That means that the, the receiver, uh, the transmitter and receiver uh, are at slightly different sample clocks, which once again leads to distortion uh, in the modem and possibly bit errors. So the next step is uh, I've simulated what happens when you've got a difference in the um, sampling timing of 10%. So the receiver's 10% difference to the transmitter in where it takes those samples. And once again, you see that scatter. Uh, this, this example has no noise added to it all, or frequency offset, but the effect is exactly the same as adding noise. Um, you get a noisier uh, spread of points on the um, scatter diagram. And if you had too much of a timing offset, eventually, uh, you know, a point on one side would move across a zero line and you'd get bit errors. So the way we correct for this is we have another algorithm called timing offset estimation. And that works out exactly what, or the receiver works out exactly what the sampling clock of the transmitter was and uses DSP techniques to recover and correct for that. So the demodulators tend to be a fair bit more complex than the modulators as you've got to um, estimate parameters like uh, frequency offsets, timing offsets, and try and get them right. Those estimation algorithms aren't perfect, so you never get exactly those sort of perfect two points I showed you. You get little balls usually. Um, and of course additive noise makes it all worse. But a good modem 
will maintain all that synchronisation right down to low signal to noise ratios and still give you a good performance. Um, so what, I've, what we've just done now in DSP speak is uh, we've built a, a binary phase shift keyed or BPSK modem. It's got raised cosine filtering and we've simulated its performance over additive white Gaussian noise channels with frequency and timing offsets. That all sounds a bit scary, but uh, when we move through it step by step, it wasn't too bad. Um, a BPSK modem is a theoretical optimum modem in terms of if you've got a watt of power, that'll get a better bit error rate than any other sort of modem. So uh, that's the end of the, the basic tutorial and happy to answer questions. Mm. Stunned silence. Oh, there's one. Where do you stand on Keith's assertion that if you don't include forward error correction, you're an idiot? Uh, <laughs> I'm an idiot. Because <laughs> there's some things that I don't put FEC into. Yeah. 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 He didn't hear it in context, so he doesn't, he can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? Is it a good place to start getting a grounding into the maths you need to understand? Hmm. Some of it is, um, yeah, I don't know, good question. Uh, if you look at the, the script there, a lot of it, so there is some complex maths involved, with complex numbers and things. That's about as tough as it gets, sort of year 12 complex numbers. Yeah, so year 12 text, I suppose. Yeah, yeah online first year comm stuff, some of this, yeah. Yes. Oh yes. Although the, at the mo at the moment I'm playing with um, uh, some other parts around the system, but the whole free DV system is still being worked on quite a lot. I've got a talk on Wednesday uh, where I'll talk about what I've been doing the last twelve months there. Yeah, been doing some embedded work and also working on some new schemes with forward error correction. So I'm not uh, brain damaged, or <laughs> well, with more forward error correction anyway. I use a little bit at the moment. Uh, and the other thing that's happening is. Uh, a bunch of guys in the States uh, with Bruce Perenza building a, a VHF open source walkie talkie running Android and Codec 2. Yeah. Uh, they call it a white box and so rather than a black box because it's all open. Mm. And yeah, a few other things going on, but that's all I can remember off the top of my head. And I'll talk about some of those on Wednesday. Mm. I saw another hand. Yes. What sort of? FEC. FEC. Um, I've, most of my work has been done with um, FreeDV, and uh, I'm using a simple block code called a GoLay code, but only to pr protect part of the bits, the most sensitive bits in the speech codec payload. Yeah, so it's horses for courses. I came up for that sort of allocation based on the bits I had available. And, uh, and now I'm currently working on some LDPC codes uh, for a, a more advanced version of FreeDV, the FreeDV waveform. Mm. But I don't know much about, I know about modems and codecs, but I don't know too much about FEC. That's where I just resort to other people's code. Yes? Uh, when you said that the um, BPSK modem was good uh, in terms of having a lot of transmitter power, how would it... It's good in power efficiency. In terms of, yeah, power efficiency. So with a given signal-to-noise ratio, you'll get a better bit error rate than virtually any other modulation what scheme. What sort of other schemes work better in other circumstances? Oh, well, things like FSK will work better um, when uh, there's, say, a lot uh, phase distortion in the channel. Um, because binary phase shift keying depends on the phase, recovering the phase of the channel. And some channels like, say, a HF channel is not so great uh, for preserving the phase of the channel. Uh, there's other implementation reasons might, why you might want to use another sort of modem. BP, phase shift keyed in general is complex demodulators and complex hardware. Mobile phones use something called GMSK, which has, is just easier to build, in particular transmitters and power amplifiers. So sometimes that's why you choose other. And there's various variants of PSK, there's bin I'm using BPSK, but we, there's other variants of phase shift keying as well. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of um, implementations, especially those that have <coughs> data out in the air, use some form of QAM. Your QAM is a form of um, phase shift keying. Yeah. Yeah, just with a more complex constellation. Yeah. Uh, yes? How does this translate to an actual antenna? I mean, I can, I can see the digital part of it, and I can see sure. the part of it. How does what you're describing actually make it to... So, um, in there, there's a, the signal called TX, the thing that I plotted the spectrum of. If you fed that through a D to A converter, you could drive an antenna with it. Maybe through a power amplifier first.
Yes. This is possibly a, a bad question, but um, when you started with the your sort of standard digital binary one and zero wave or square wall and square wave, um, a ba basic knowledge of the frequency spectrum of a square wave means there there are going to be all those yes. lobes. Obviously, your filtering down to something that's more like a sine wave. Um, if you're starting with an actual sine wave, what options do you have for making, um, for, for transmitting binary data using you know, either phases or um, op, you know, permutations of the, the sine wave? So this is actually a, a mathematically equivalent to using two different phases. One minus one are like cos of pi and cos of zero. So that's binary phase shift keying. You can also use quadrature phase shift keying where you have four phases or eight phases. Or you can combine the phases with amplitudes and have, say, you know, a grid of 16 dots. Yeah. And they, um, as the points get closer together, you've got a higher chance of a bit error because um, they're closer together. And there's less distance to go before you cross a decision region. A decision boundary, but um, they ca carry more information, so the bit rate's higher. Mm. So there's all those sort of pros and cons to balance up when you design a certain modem wave form for a certain channel. Yes. 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 Um, it's just a way to plot. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, the code has been inspected, and on the scatter diagram, someone's found that I'm plotting on the y-axis the imaginary part of the signal, and on the x-axis the real. Uh, the imaginary part is 90 degrees out of phase with the real, and it's a way of just conveying the phase of the signal through the maths. Um, it's real and imaginary, as in complex numbers. I sort of didn't want to... I'm not sure how many people know complex numbers and didn't want to go there. But <laughs> uh, it's just a way of handling phase in the maths as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, or an Argan diagram, I think they call it at high school or something. Yeah. Uh, well, the spectral plots I did before were done with Fourier transforms. Yeah. I converted from the time to the frequency domain using a Fourier transform uh, routine. Yeah. Scatter plot, no. No, that's plotting complex numbers on an XY plane, effectively. Oh, yeah, I can't really. <laughs> You got me there. <laughs> I'll try to look up the maths book. Yeah. yeah. I'm an engineer, I just know the formulas. <laughs> yes? Yeah, have you got a um, <coughs> best digital coding scheme so we know when you come through modes? A best digital coding scheme? Yeah, like, um, I suppose it's related to Ford Aircraft, which is different. I'm not familiar enough, familiar enough with it, but I know you can put the right digital bit through and it reduces the chance of it. Uh, well, you can use forward error correction where you send um, uh, redundant information to help correct for bit errors afterwards. Somehow it reduces the number. It uses five bits to use four bits or something. You're less likely to get two the same in the lower block. I can't think of the right word. It might be a um, line, in co line encoding sort of scheme. Yeah. Often that's used on wireline stuff rather than radio. But, uh, yeah, yeah. That might be like the next layer up. This stuff's real physical layer stuff and what you do is you... Mm -hmm. I was actually referring to where you, when you were talking about the quadrature modulation, where you, um, the points on the plot actually represent a symbol. Yes. And that's the Number of bits per symbol, perhaps. Yeah. Yes. And then, and then the symbol translates back into the original code. code. If you're doing phase recovery and there's a long string of ones or a long string of zeros, you, it messes up your phase recovery. So you yeah, with a lot of phase. Yeah, with a lot of phase estimation algorithms, they will get screwed up. But you can also put scramblers on the signal to keep it pseudo-random. That's yeah, another thing to do. Like like yes. So that's like, this is a binary um, phase shift keying. If you have a high order constellation, like say four points on that dot, quadrature phase shift keying, then they're often grey coded. So that um, if you get a single, if it crosses from here to here, you only get a single bit error. So you're probably thinking about like higher order modulation schemes. In that case, more than one bit per symbol is transmitted. I didn't make a distinction between bits but, and symbols, but 
each of those samples could, could convey more than one uh, bit of information. Mm. Yes? So how do you go from what you've shown us today to something like a modern DSL modem? Okay, so a modern DSL modem is a multi-tone modem. It has a bunch of these carriers. I just showed one. It has them stretching from just over 300, 3,000 kilohertz, just above the audible telephone, right, right up to, I don't know, mega, megabit hertz or something. And it automatically, um, it's got another software algorithm that can um, estimate the quality of the channel and which of those modem tones will make it through or not and allocate power appropriately. So imagine 100 of these things running in parallel. Yeah, instead of all being at 500 kilohertz, they're offset a little bit. But yep, exactly the same stuff. Bunch of modems in parallel but with some channel estimation smarts because radio channels, you know, you get noise and you get fading and stuff, but a telephone, piece of telephone wire can be really crappy and it can change all the time. Mm. But exactly the same principles, yeah. You've still got your carrier recovery, timing recovery, you're mixing, uh, you can't send it at baseband along a telephone line because you've already got people talking, so you need to mix it up to a carrier. Would, uh, would you only mix the carrier recovery on a couple of the channels? So if yeah. That's right, they should be synced. What you might do is also combine all the information from all the channels to get a better estimation no. of the uh, transmit carrier. Yeah. You still get phase. Stuff coming in and out of phase, different frequencies on phone lines, like you do with HF propagation. So. Yep, it's a good example. Yeah. Even your telephone, the old school telephone modems, fax machines, same sort of stuff underneath. Mm. Yes? Uh, you'd use just at least twice the frequency of the highest frequency component when you modulate. So in that case, say, two megabits, two mega samples per second. Or what you might do, I, I did the whole thing in DSP, and you can do that these days. You could also output it at a lower frequency than use an analog mixer to mix it up to, I don't know, microwave or something. Yeah. Similar principles are in your, your modems for your phone and your um, Wi-Fi, etc. Yes? <coughs> Okay, cool. Yeah, nice. Any other questions? Yes? Do you have a similar tutorial for things like DSK31? No, but it's a similar... Yeah, yeah. Very similar. In fact, that would probably be a pretty good example. Just to push this to a few more slides, uh, we could probably show that. It's very similar. Yeah. And we could probably get it to the point where you can then hook it up to a, a radio and decode off air. Especially at those low symbol rates, 31 symbols per second, um, that, that simulation program I was using, Octave, would run in real time. Mm.